Testing, one, two, three. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Castelli with the Oregon Department of State. I'm a policy and legislative analyst. Hello, I'm Justin Clure with Pacific Energy Ventures, consultant working in this sector. Julia Kelly, I'm the Ocean Energy Coordinator with ODFW. Hi, I'm Scott McMullen with the Oregon Fisherman's Cable Committee, NASDAQ. Anno Husing, uh, Director of the Lincoln County Planning and Development Department. Laurel Hillman, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. Jason Bush, the Oregon Wave Energy Trust. Andy Lanier, the Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Joanne Manson, Master Planner for the Oregon Military <laughs> Department. And on the phone, Walter. Walter Chuck, Port in, uh, Port of Newport. And Judy. Judy Linton with the Corps of Engineers. Anybody else on the phone? Uh, okay. I know uh, Captain Rick Williams will be joining us by phone at about 1.45. So. Uh, let's hit the folks in the audience real quick. Ken Homolka, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, Dave Fox, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Matt Sanders, Oregon Boy of Energy Trust. Wilson Gerald, University of Oregon Law Student and intern with Lincoln County. Uh, Colt Cito, and Sam. And I'm Sabrina, Rules Coordinator, DSL. Uh, so volume check for folks on the phone. How are you hearing us? Sounds oh, good. Good, just fine. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, so a couple housekeeping matters. Uh, restrooms out the door here. Hang a left. You can't miss them. I think there are water fountains down that there way. Are water well. fountains down there. Yes. Fantastic. Um, if you didn't otherwise print out your own agenda packet for today. There's a stack of them right next to Andy there. If there's anybody in the audience that would like an agenda packet, just come on up and grab one. There is also, on top there, Andy, something different. That first. So we do need one? You want this? I can share it with you. So that is something different. I'll hand this one out here. It's a lot thicker than that. I apologize, I've got a separate sheet here that didn't make it into the agenda packet. For folks on the phone, when we get uh, to this item, we're going to talk about this one-page handout. Uh, don't worry, uh, I'm going to read through it anyway, so you won't miss anything. Uh, let's see, other housekeeping. Well, we don't have to worry about parking, that's nice. <laughs> Or tsunamis. Or tsunamis, for that matter. Or 100-year floodplains. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, of course, cookies. Make sure you avail yourself of the cookies. Have you heard Jason? from um, either uh, Keith Timchuk or... Uh, who's the other person? Nick Hunter. Well, we, well, Nick was here last time, but uh, Charlie, Robin Hartman, Robin Hartman yeah. uh, neither Robin. of those folks were at the last meeting and right. they don't appear to be here today. So Keith said he would be here today, so I'm not sure where he's at. Um, yeah, we did specifically pick a date to make sure he could be here since he missed the first one. So, and who else? Robin Hartman. Yeah, so she wasn't at the first meeting either. I tried phoning her. I didn't hear back. Yeah, let's see if we can figure out what's going on there, Chris. That's all right. Hopefully everything's okay. We're working with her on another rack, so. Uh, uh, so, agenda today, pretty full one. Uh, I'm going to do a couple uh, catch up things from meeting number one, uh, touch on a few uh, products real quick from that. Chris has also uh, prepared a couple memos to touch on uh, some parking lot issues from meeting one. You'll recall that we're sort of keeping a laundry list of all the issues that folks are bringing up that we can't necessarily deal with at the moment in time. So as those continue to come up, we'll continue to uh, chart those. Uh, we're then going to uh, switch over to uh, have Jason uh, give us a presentation on research and demonstration projects. That's going to segue us into a discussion about um, general authorizations versus general permits to get that regulatory approval from uh, DSL that's now required as a result of Senate Bill 319. Uh, hopefully today you'll have enough information that you can give uh, Chris and I some direction as to whether you think 
research and demonstration projects are more appropriately steered towards the general, uh, general authorization or the general permit. As part of that, I'll do a recap from meeting one to explain the differences again. Um, after that, we're going to take a break. Then Chris is going to pick it up to talk about the resource inventory and effects evaluation checklist and the operations plan checklist that he's put together in draft form. Uh, item number seven, we're going to talk about the JART structure and how that's going to work looking forward. We'll open it up for public comment after that. And then we'll talk about what our game plan is going to meet, uh, be for meeting number three, including where we want to do that. Uh, if there's anything we can't finish today, we'll, we'll punt to meeting number three, but with a little bit of luck, hopefully we can get through it all today. Any questions on the agenda? Folks on the phone, okay with the agenda? And for just keeping some sort of order, I know we're a pretty small, intimate group today, but let's, I would try to use the tents to just get our attention, whether it be uh, for myself or whomever might be talking, you have questions, and I'll try to keep track of sort of the queue if we get a handful of those up. Will, will we be branded undisciplined if we don't use the tents? I think we can, uh, yes. I think we can uh, self-regulate ourselves. I, I think some of us already have that brand, but we won't mention it. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get going right into... Um, agenda item number three. So after meeting one, uh, Chris and I sent to you, I think about a week after that, you got an email that was a transcription of all the post-it, big post-it sheets I put all over the room. Um, so uh, that is your first uh, handout in the agenda packet. So uh, the first page is agenda item number four, expected topic areas for RAC engagement. I'm not going to go over this in detail again, but I do want to explain the purpose of this now is basically this is the punch list for this group. By the end of this process, we want to make sure that we've developed administrative rules that to the extent appropriate hit on every one of these topics. So basically our contractor's punch list. Uh, if there's anything in there you don't understand, please let me know. I did organize them by which DSL division number uh, we think we'll be addressing them and which piece of legislation directed us to do that. On the next two pages, you'll remember I went around the room and had each of you speak to kind of what are your key concerns or your key needs? What, what do you or your constituents have to get out of this process? So that's just uh, the next two pages. I just captured that from each of you. The really important item is on the next page. Rack member key issues distilled by DSL staff. So that's a list of 12 items. Does everybody see that? That's kind of a boil down of all the things you guys told me. I'm reviewing it. Chris and I saw kind of 12 common themes. So looking at this, I kind of view this as, uh, at the end of our process, this will be our report card. So we'll have our punch list, the things we've got to get done, but then the bigger question is, did we do them in a way that address your key concerns? So hopefully by the end of the process, all of you will be able to say either, yeah, the way you guys have crafted the rules, it addresses these 12 key concerns, or at least at a minimum, you can say, there's nothing in the rules that undermines these 12 key issues and concerns. Is that fair? I think it's fair. Okay. Uh, the last page is just uh, the running list of parking lot issues. As I said, we'll continue to build that list over the next couple meetings, but also over time, hopefully, we'll take things off the parking lot list as we address them. Um, so that's all I had on that. Questions before we move on? Okay, so Chris, you were actually, you'd put together a memo that starts to address some of those parking lot issues. Yeah, yeah, so including like, parking lot issue number one at least, uh, is, is teed up in the memo 
that uh, we, we prepared for the RAC today, um, along with some of the things that were asked of the group, was sort of to put all the pertinent definitions in one spot for, that, uh, that came out of both uh, the legislative legislation a couple years ago, the 2015 legislative session, and also what's already existing in the rules. So we tried to do that and then also tee up a question for us to discuss uh, as you guys would like as we move forward here today. So we do, uh, put all these definitions in one spot. Ocean Renewable Energy Facility is now defined in statute after Senate Bill 319 passed. It means any energy conversion technology or device that is used as a necessary component of a research project, which we have to find a new demonstration project or commercial operation to generate ocean renewable energy. Uh, and it's about and it kind of lists the different um, aspects of the facility there. Commercial operation is also defined in statute. Then we get to a couple things that are mentioned in the statute. Demonstration project and research project are both defined in the rule, the rule that's open and that we are considering here. Uh, de demonstration project is a limited duration non-commercial activity authorized under temporary use authorization granted by the department to a person for the construction, installation, operation, or removal of an ocean energy facility on state-owned submerged submersible lands uh, to test the economic and or te technological viability of establishing a commercial operation. Demonstration project may be temporarily connected to the grid for testing purposes without being a commercial operation. Being a commercial operation would kick it to an ocean energy facility uh, lease as opposed to being a uh, eligible for a temporary use authorization. Then there's a definition for research project, uh, which I just noticed is in the statute, so we're talking about research project. Yeah, right. uh, okay. Of course, research project is a very similar non-commercial activity uh, granted to an educational research institution for the placement of, of a device for testing. Um, the purpose of that research project is to obtain scientific data related to ocean wave energy and or to test the techno technology used or functionality of an experimental ocean energy conversion device. Some of the differences between these two demonstration projects and research project in this rule have been the application fee. Uh, it's a lesser application fee for a research project, 250 as opposed to 750. And there has been a term limit for research projects of five years. Well, there was not a limit on a term for the demonstration project for a commercial entity testing. Um, although now there is uh, for pilot projects. And let me just finish this, Jason, and we'll get to your question. Um, pilot project was defined in territorial sea plan as um, having the same meaning as a demonstration project. With the exception of the pilot project, the part five has some other sideboards, and one of them being that it has a term no longer than five years. So. I can stop there, and uh, if you want to discuss those definitions, it looks like, Jason, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of uh, expose a couple issues, I think, I'm not sure why I'll answer them right now, but just get them on the table. Um, so how, how would you guys think about uh, this uh, research project versus something that shows up under uh, section 120, 141, 125. How would you distinguish those two? They both appear to be limited to academic institutions or scientific endeavors as opposed to, say, a, a wave energy company that wanted to put a scientific device out. Just by definition, it seems to exclude that. Is it truly limited only uh, academic institutions, for example? So the research project, as defined and, and used, because it has been used in Division 140, you've actually been for testing ocean energy conversion devices. So not testing um, the um, do, just collecting scientific information in the territorial sea. An example was an OSU uh, device that was tested at, uh, in conjunction with Finnevere, and that was an ocean energy conversion device. And that, so it's that showed up under 140, not 125. 140. Yeah. So, would 125 ever, do you think 125 is ever going to apply to any of this? When will we ever need that? Currently, and that's, that's the second part of the memo, uh, 
currently 125 is applied when people want to deploy scientific measuring devices, not an ocean energy conversion device, but um, acoustic Doppler profile. Not, not an ADCP. No, that, that would be 125. Oh, oh. Yeah, that would be just a scientific test. But we can get to that. Should we cover that then? Because that's one of the questions for the, the rack. Yeah. Um, right, so the the other issue is um, and I, we're going to get there. It sounds like so we'll just table that for right now. But the only other thing that I wanted to uh, raise was uh, probably channeling Rick Williams now. Demonstration projects. I mean, I we generally think the demonstration project, the demonstrating the viability of the technology, doesn't work. Is it flow? Does it create electricity? But um, uh, the other aspect of that is demonstrating the economic viability of a project. So you would be selling uh, power onto the grid. Uh, you would be analyzing the operations and maintenance costs. You're trying to get to what we refer to as the LCOE, levelized cost of energy, which is you know, the lifetime cost of energy for a project. That's how retros retroactively you look back at a, at a project or a technology and say, this is how much it costs to operate on a, on a, on a, on a life cycle basis. Now you compare between other sources of energy like wind, onshore, offshore, natural gas, et cetera. So we want to get to that LCOE. Um, the demonstration projects could go on for um, a demonstration project that was attempting to identify the, the, the cost of doing that project, of creating electricity from that device, could take some time. Uh, and, he would be selling, and he would be selling the power commercially onto the grid. Um, I think we would get into some gray area if we start saying, yeah, well, I'm selling onto the grid, but I'm only doing it to demonstrate the economic viability of the, te of the technology. Okay. I think that could be a problem. Does that okay. make sense? I see blanks there. No. Well, I, I have a little um, question. Of how do you get to the levelized cost of energy on a, on a small demonstration project? You're Only really multiple years. You'd have to sort of back into if you, it'd be like a sample. If you did five years of a project, what would be a 20-year project? Yeah. Say, well, it costs this much for five years. We can probably get pretty close to what the 20 years could be. But, but then you're still uh, having all these costs associated with, say, one device rather than saying, you know, the efficiencies that come when you have 20 devices. Agreed. So, Agreed. admittedly, you can't really, you won't be able to say this is the levelized cost. I agree 100%. LCOE, the, the, a real LCOE will not exist for marine energy for many, many years. A multiple projects in the water, looking back at how much this stuff costs over a 20-year process. But DOE and the, the metrics that guide this conversation, especially at the federal level, is all about LCOE. If we can't talk in terms of LCOE, we're at a disadvantage. If we don't come up with some number that is equivalent to the LCOE as best as we can do. So DOE, for example, takes as their standard. Like Our job is to reduce the LCOE of wave energy from X to Y. Mm -hmm. What the heck is that? And we won't know for many years, but we are certainly going to do our best to try to answer the question. So, hence a five-year demonstration project. So Andy has, Andy's up next. Yeah, so I guess you, then I see the commercial activity part of this definition as being the crux of the issue because you, you're you raising the issue that they're actually going to want to be having the power go to the grid and to actually receive some sort of revenue from that device mm -hmm. as it's connected while it's in a testing phase. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do, so yeah, that's, that's Okay, so that is that is not what we're defining as commercial, then? No, I'm saying, I'm saying, saying your is. example that you just gave would be a commercial. If they're, if they're making money, it's commercial. Well, well I guess that's, 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 that's the issue Jason's <laughs> raising, I think. Is yeah. It says the demonstration project may be temporarily connected to the regional power grid for testing purposes without being a commercial operation. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably, you would be selling the power onto the grid. You're not giving the electricity away. That, and I don't know if we're going to answer it, but I do want to... So I'm just, yeah, I'm pointing out that that's, yeah. the, that's the crux of the yes. issue here, is if you want to be able to actually do the LCOE, it, then you do need to have the flexibility to be able to generate some of the revenue that's got, a part of the If you got blank stares or, or not, not responsive questions from us after you completed, it's sort of like we're, I was waiting for the rest of the, set, the sentence, which should have been if, uh, if, if companies are required to do this, 
then then they, they're really disadvantaged somehow that they can't make that work. I mean, so that can you can you further say that we're we're being deprived of an opportunity? I, that's where I think you're going with this. I, 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 I don't can you think share that with us later. Or you think it should be in this? Let's get right to that. I, I, don't, I don't see anything that we're necessarily being deprived. I'm just pointing out that I think there's internal inconsistency between uh, in the de in the demonstration project definition. Um, if ultimately the most important thing about the project is whether it pencils out, um, will that will a company attempt to demonstrate that through a demonstration project, which could last for five years, for example? And I would see how. It would be you would get into a discussion then about whether or not that's really just a commercial project, couching it in terms of a demonstration project, thus qualifying for low, low, lower level permitting requirements, lower costs, lower oversight, for example. And there is those, there could be those things under Part Five. Agreed. Some of those. Justin has a question. Oh, I was just going to interject, so I was trying to abide by the rules and be branded. Um, <laughs> financial profit as a goal. I think Delia said this. Um, I think that's the critical crux here because anything that falls under demonstration project, financial profit is unlikely a goal. Mm -hmm. um, the word profit, I think, is the key part of that. You know, revenue is different than profit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I think the other just clarification on, on the concept of LCOE. So we use the word LCOE as an LCOE model. So you're gonna you're gonna use a demonstration project to inform that model and make assumptions, validate some assumptions, whether it's on the energy side or any other component of it, and then you're gonna use that model to then tell you where to go to the next scale device. So I don't think the LCOE at a demonstration project is ever gonna be perfect and tell you if you made it or not. I think what you're doing in a demonstration project is informing the information that goes into that model per se and it tells you what things you should be focusing on to get to the next next step. So there's just a little cart before the horse there when we're talking LCOE around a demonstration project. It's not, not the end all by any means. Doesn't this definition come from statute? The definition of commercial operation does and ocean renewable energy facility. We not, not demonstration. Not demonstration project. It's, no way it's, it's sort of linked to part part five, and that's this defi definition of linked a little bit now. Um, but our, this rule is open, and it's something we're looking at. Yes. And you said pilot project has the same definition of demonstration project. Yeah, that how, is in. How, how is that determined? It is. How, how is it determined that, that it's defined the same? Yeah. It, sa it says it. Part five has a definition for demonstration project, and it refers back to Division One Four. Uh, oh, oh, so TSP says that pilot project has a definition of in in OARs for demonstration project. Yes. Pilot project on so page twelve. What, but the, in that, I don't know. Isn't the pilot project the first part of the multi-stage project that we wanted? We almost all insisted that that's the right way to do a project. Do a pilot. Make sure that it works. Right. You're selling the power onto the grid. Hopefully, you're making some money. Maybe it's not profitable at that point, but you're selling the power on the grid. It could qualify at some level as a demonstration project to your potential financiers and stakeholders. Uh, but it's also possibly the phase one of a four-stage or three-stage project, phase project. Right. But if the definition of uh, from part five is the same as a demonstration project, then that sort of spins it back to a Agreed. non commercial activity. As a non commercial activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has to be a non commercial activity. Yeah. Without changing the order. Non commercial operation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now so so the the only thing that, that strikes me as uh, a concern there is if there's any limitation on whether or not a demonstration project is also a pilot phase one pilot project could be extended can it, can it stay in the water after it's done being a demonstration project? Well, in that case, part five, we have to take a look back at part five, because besides saying that they're, def that they're defined, they sort of are linked, part five goes on to say a lot more about what, what pilot project includes, and I thought it said, let's take a quick look at part hey. five. Mm -hmm. oh, we have hey, Chris, this is Walter on the phone. Can I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I, this, this has a, I have a, a kind of an issue with this demonstration and pilot project. If it's going to be either part of a phase one of any type of build out, 
um, what would be the permitting pro would the demonstration project be do done under a different permitting project than if they were to expand it? Um, so, uh, at the risk of jumping ahead a little bit, from, from the removal fill permitting perspective, we're going to be talking about research and demonstration projects and an expedited regulatory permit process for them. If we're talking about projects right. that segue into full commercial operation, that becomes a different animal that would need a different form of regulatory approval. Well, I just, Jason was talking about this a pilot or a demonstration project being phase one of a potential commercial development. How does that not become a commercial development to begin with if their plan is to possibly have that be a phase, a first phase of a, of a larger project? So I think we have a couple, of, I, I found something I can let, let Andy go and then on out and I'll see if I can add anything. Yeah, under Territorial Sea Part 5, uh, under the pilot project section, there's two bullet points that relate to this discussion. Uh, one of them is E. It talks about the fact that the pilot project will have a term of five years unless some other um, condition occurs or unacceptable level of environmental effect occurs. I think that would then go into decommissioning. And then under bullet F here, it says that... Um, it will require decommissioning unless a, an authorization for a commercial renewable energy facility is sought. So I think there is your connection to the phased and approach. I, and I, I will add a little bit, and then on, I on the next page says a pilot project that provides the necessary and sufficient information may become a phased development. So there's a link to it becoming a phased development. Going back to the rules we're looking at, a demonstration project is the, is the, and this is something we talked about in the memo, is, is the one the authorization that allows you that first right to apply for a lease. So it's sort of expected if you're investing in testing an actual device at that location uh, and, and things go well, you'd have the first crack at applying for an ocean energy facility lease at that spot. And I don't want to lose this point. Um, the one thing I... Th I think we're trying to look at, this all started with the definition of demonstration project, and I'm trying to distill, before we get too lost, I'm going to Otto and then Scott, the question, <laughs> the question is still about that definition, is there some clarity that, that, that the RAC would, would want to add to the definition that would say you could sell power as long as we're profitable or something along those lines, or it wasn't? I think it says right in there that a demonstration project may be temporarily connected to the grid for testing purposes without being a commercial operation. Mm -hmm. And commercial operation has um, financial profit as a goal. Has financial profit as a goal. So do you think there's some, is the racket that the definition is to clarify? I okay. think the less that is better. If, if it's already in the rules, don't add more verbiage. I agree. Were you saying again? I didn't hear you. I think, uh, I don't think it needs more clarity. If it's not, if, if it's already, Clear in the rules, or so don't add more verbiage to complete more. I think it depends on whether or not. Sorry. What? I'll go after them. It's because <laughs> I jumped in to ask the question. <laughs> I was about. just answering his right. question. So. Uh, oh, I just think it depends on on you know how much flexibility for interpretation DSL wants um, on, a, on a project by project basis. Okay. As it is right now, you would be putting DSL in a position where you would have to make that clarification on a project by project basis. My interpretation. Well, well, yeah, and I would imagine DSL would rely on whatever documentation is provided to the financiers. If it's built to the financiers as a profit making venture, then right, it's not, it fails the definition of demonstration project. Okay. Mr. Guzzi. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> I think I just got a Feel yeah, promotion. Promotion. promotion on, on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let the record show that Anno using used his tent. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I think the perils of being too too attached to this is that one does lose in a in a group of this size, we lose the thread of conversation. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's just my editorial comment. I'm not running the meeting. Just in response to what we've been talking about. Let, let's Let's go back and, and just for a minute try to understand what sort of 
the kind of the policy elements of the so let's put aside this OAR or this statute or whatever like that. I from the perspective of some communities that there is a a clear desire to help expedite and put as few obstacles between legitimate testing and demonstration projects that are of limited duration, uh, limited scale, that really get information. It's one of the reasons the community has embraced the PMEC type model is that we have a place that we can go to that's already been vetted in terms of its impacts on the environment and to the communities where these devices should go. And that as much of this accelerated, expedited, however, streamlining, all these buzzwords that one wants, one wants to put, presume it like a general authorization, why wouldn't we encourage that kind of fast tracking? Because the hard questions have been asked about the location, the impacts to the communities, and, and we're, in effect, corralling different kinds of potential impacts on the environment and other, and, and other users of the ocean to those places. And so uh, I think some of the language and the direction that inspired the kind of language we're talking about and, and the university side of things was that's exactly what that would accomplish, is that we were, we're going to really let these areas go in terms of its maybe its public review and all these other kinds of things because we've, we've made a lot of those upfront tough calls up to this is where we really want to promote this kind of activity, which is kind of like, in, in retrospect, maybe Rylea should have that kind of, a, if, if in fact every time someone wants to test a shallow water device that happens at Rylea, maybe there, there ought to be more of an official recognition that that's what Riley is using. I'm just using it as a, as a case in point. So as we try to unravel what OAR and what procedural something or other, or whether it's commercial or not, I mean, obviously everybody's in this to make money if they're a, if they're a company, whether they get bought or this or that. So it's true, those kind of definitions sometimes can be unhelpful in terms of trying to call out what everybody can seemingly be for versus it be having a commercial slant or something to it. So I just wanted to offer that um, sort of perspective that um, there's some stuff there that, that is anchored to the university approach for those reasons, because the comfort level from everybody is really high if we go do it in those areas, versus this sort of ad hoc, I want to do something here, like OPT did with, first it's a 10 buoy project, then all of a sudden it's going to be 200 buoys, and no, never mind, it's going to be this other footprint. And we got back and forth, and we whipsawed that community, and we had so many con conflicting messages, and that you know this so-called demonstration project, which never happened, of course, it would have been 10 buoys, was of course meant to be the build-out of a much larger facility. And that's the kind of stuff that we have to strive to get out from under that kind of activity where something's being postured as one thing, and we all know it's something else. Thank you. Scott? Well, uh, just I wanted to get clarity to keep the show on so that we can not uh, lose the train of thought. Uh, and, and Andy talked about a pilot converting to a commercial operation. What I wanted to ask is, uh, is it clear then that that would trigger a separate permitting process? Say they get to to uh, year four of a demo pro of a pilot project, and they want to turn it, keep it in place, turn it into a commercial project. They would require a whole new permitting process going forward as a commercial. Is that correct? That's but, how I read yeah. this bullet F under uh, on part five. With, but, with the caveat, as as far as the uh, language that, it, in my mind, it's kind of sloppy language when when this profit as a goal because. It's pretty easy to just say, well, we're not we're not looking for profit as a goal. We're just trying to test this, but we have to do this and that. Uh, hook it to the grid and check. Um, it seems like it's sloppy language, and that's something that this uh, body ought to try to clarify, so we don't end up with this uh, loose, debatable uh, language that's subject to interpretation down the road. We ought to we ought to solve it here and now, rather than leave that for. Uh, debate at a later time. I, I agree. Um, it, it seems to me I can, haven't been quite put my hand on it, but I'm about to start drawing a Venn diagram to see where they, they overlap. My God, that's what I wanted. 
But I think there's something to that. A demonstration project, irrespective of whether the company wants to make money, of course the company wants to make money off of it. Um, and they might not even know whether they're going to make money off of it until they're two, three, four, five years down the road. If they don't turn a profit for the first four years, but do something to improve it in the fifth year, all of a sudden they're making a profit. It's no longer a demonstration project. I, I think there's no reason to get into those conversations. Demonstration project, insofar as it's as of a temporary nature, minimal impact on the environment, um, uh, you know, uh, not a um, we also can go, but a handful of characteristics like that, it's a demonstration project. And if they ever want to parlay that into a permanent commercial project, then you go through the permitting process to be able to keep your device in the water. Yep. I, I agree. And I think that the way the pilot project is defined in Part 5. Makes sense. That's that. that yeah. Yeah. You get That's some breaks everything. for doing a pilot project as well. You get some breaks from uh, needing to fill out mm. at least the operation plan uh, personal territorials. But the expectation is that if something bad happens, you pull it out, right? That's the, there's no really adaptive management. If something happens, you take it out. And that would be a, something to consider for the regulatory permit, too. Correct. Right. So I just, again, following Jason's thread, it's like, that's all fine and good, but let's call a spade a spade. If, if, we, are, if we are now going to depart from identify test areas that have been fully vetted with the communities and we agree probably have, have the least environmental impacts and we're doing something else. And, uh, and it's a demo project. It still occupies ocean space for five years, which for impacted communities is a long time. And, uh, and on top of that, it's done explicitly with the hope that it, it expands in that location. And therefore, if we do that, I think it's entirely responsible for the state of Oregon to not streamline that. If it's going to be that, then it needs to have all of the kind of public review, high levels of scrutiny, so that it can be completely vetted. So really, so there is no sort of where we're not having to rely on companies saying, "Oh no, we're not really interested in that," and have to find out because we're reading an 800-page document that buried in there <coughs> on a FERT filing. All of a sudden, yes, they do have those plans. I don't want to relive that era at all, not for a minute. And so, because I'm not sure who's going to read those 800-page documents. Therefore, having a very transparent, clear set of understandings going into it, I think should be good for the industry, should be good for the communities, because we're not playing the shell game that, that marked so much of what we were doing in the past. Is that, Delia was next to here. So I, we may have cut you off, Chris. You may have been getting to this in your uh, description, <laughs> I suspect. Um, but in, in my reviewing, uh, what I found is that there are some sideboards provided in, in Part 5, Section F, um, uh, when it talks about the pilot project, um, and that that could be used to fulfill the, uh, the inventory requirements under B4. Um, but that wouldn't, there's nothing in here that says whether that would or wouldn't then initiate a permitting process for the commercial part, the commercial phase. And so I think what I'm hearing is that there's parties that feel like that needs to be spelled out in rule when we bring um, the RFP process in and, and couple it more directly with the proprietary process. It should be described that you go through phase, you go through the pilot in order to get the information you need to fill the inventory and then that inventory helps you flesh out your application. And that application would include uh, public review. That's, that's my interpretation. I think, I think other people have that interpretation of part five too, um, but maybe we can't rely on it completely. Maybe that needs to be spelled out that, because that, Kirk, I heard you say that there's a, there's a, a new process for the commercial build out, right? No, for the RFP? Yeah, so let me clarify that. So in fact, so what you said was right, I'm just going to sort of put it in my regulatory words. Yeah. Um, so uh, for the demonstration five-year duration type project, we're talking about, we're going to be talking shortly about a general authorization or general permit that would provide expedited process. That permit would only be good for five years. At the end of five years, one of two things happens. Either that project's out of the water 
or it has secured an individual permit for bigger, longer duration, whatever the case may be. So at that point, it would need to secure uh, what we call our individual permit process, which I do have to point out is a discretionary permit process. Just because you got an authorization for the demonstration project is not a guarantee that you get a permit for the full build out. It's, it gets its own uh, evaluation, public review process, and stuff. Okay. And is, is that is, Yeah, is that already laid out in rule? So by default, it, it's not laid out in rule yet, but it's laid out in statute because uh, Senate Bill 319 says there's a zero cubic yard threshold for uh, ocean renewable energy projects. So as it stands right now today, research, demonstration, or full commercial project has to get an individual permit. It's only by the work we do here that we might come up with a more streamlined process for research and demonstrations. So then I guess it's just important that there not be a loophole there where having, you know, if we agree to a general permit and the sideboard's on a general mm -hmm. permit um, and uh, get, get to a place where that could have uh, some first right to apply, uh, that that, do that doesn't supersede the need for a public process, due process for the individual permit that would be appropriate for the commercial development. Uh, correct. And to be clear, so the first right to apply is for DSL's proprietary process, yeah. which is separate and distinct. We, we make our own decisions on the regulatory side of the house right. from whatever Chris might issue as a proprietary first right. Okay. And, and I, just to add on that, for a demonstration project, there's still currently a public review process. In fact, you'll still be convening charts. The one thing I saw that was streamlined in Part 5 is that you don't need to fulfill the requirements of Section D of Part 5, which is the operation plan, although you do have to develop a work plan that has some, very, some basic information in it. So there would still be a JAR in a public review process through the, uh, currently through the proprietary authorization. Well, quite yeah. apart from, have, the, no, from the field permit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Otto first, and then... No, Joanne first. Oh. Yeah, she <laughs> I know. I, know. <laughs> I, I just want to um, echo what um, Commissioner um, Husing was saying about the <laughs> <laughs> about the <laughs> fact <laughs> that the the TCP TSP has already identified areas that are appropriate, and so that if you do not have a, a streamlined process for those areas, then you're waiting in redundant and useless rules and, and verbiage. So I, I think that if we do not come up with a, a streamlined process for demonstration and pilot projects as part of this rule, we're, we're spinning our wheels and wasting our time. And I think it's direct, in direct um, opposition to the intent of providing for ocean renewable energy um, in the state, the, the area that uh, this, these pilot projects are even, even um, potentially expanded um, pilot projects in the appropriate designated areas could expand to is still less than 3% of the entire coastline of, of Oregon. So I'm focused on that as a planner. I'm focused on balanced resourcing. Um, I'm, I'm focused on balancing our Earth's natural resources for all users, not just select few industries. Um, otherwise, we don't expand as a, as a, I'm getting big picture here, we don't expand as a, you know, in progress as a people, as a civilization, as anything. You, you can't just focus on one industry. We've seen that happen in forestry. You have to be open to um, all different industries, but responsibly. I'm all about protecting our natural resources. So I just wanted to echo that. If we do not come up with a demonstration or some kind of streamlined process, our time here is wasted, in my opinion. Editorial comment, real quick. The good news, Joanne, is you're going to know by the end of today. Great. Uh, today, if we are or aren't, because 319 empowers you guys to advise us on exactly that question. Who is next? Uh, on a the director. Is the Sorry? Is the appropriate. <laughs> but people care to understand my current title. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, this, is, this is Walter. Can I, ask, can I ask a question, a clarifying question for you? Go ahead, go ahead Walter. 
Yeah. Um, is there any language saying, can you apply for a, an individual permit concurrently while they're doing their demonstration project? Or do you have to wait until the demonstration project five year timeline is over to apply for an individual permit? Um, uh, Kirk Jarvie here. So uh, off the top of my head, um, uh, I think a person would be free at any time to pursue a larger build out of their project and uh, apply for an individual permit at whatever point they're at in the demonstration phase. Okay, I, I, I would have a little bit of a problem with that, just with a, a demonstration project being in the water with an individual permit also being applied for at the same time. That would kind of take the uh, the spirit of a demonstration project out in my in my eyes okay well let's let's be sure we come back to that when we start talking about uh, specifically which regulatory process we're going to use and see if we can address that on what was you next yes um, I, I want to make sure that Joanne that we are in indeed in agreement so to the extent that let me let me try to capture what I think you said and what I sort of meant by what I said is that when you talk about the territorial sea plan having daylighted only a couple percent of the territorial sea for this kind of activity, a REFSA site, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Um, from the perspective of many people in the communities, the territorial sea plan is far too generous toward potential de energy development because Rumas and Rukas, almost 90% of the territorial sea, is subject to applications from energy companies to the Department of State lands. And at that point, from the community perspective that might be impacted by this, our only backstop is the JART, which is one of the reasons we care very deeply that the JART is a meaningful, substantive group. And so, if I were to agree with what I think you were saying, even though I am not happy at all with three out of four of the REFSA sites, I think they're in violation of the spirit and the letter of Goal 19. And that's one of the reasons there has been litigation over the process and what the outcome of the territorial sea plan, which had some, looking at my colleague Andy, which had some great work done. So if I'm critical about the territorial sea plan, there was an awful lot of terrific stuff that was done mm -hmm. that I think we can still build upon. But if indeed you're saying that maybe these demo projects that can morph into something much bigger later on, which is what we're trying to get at, should be confined to REFSA sites, then may, maybe indeed we do have some sense of agreement. Well, that's what Because I'm that really substantially narrows the amazing amount of real estate, the, 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 the terrific, stupendous amount of sites in the existing territorial sea plan that are subject to someone applying for these permits, individual permits or what, and going forward, that can balloon into something else. Sure, I was thinking of the risk of sites yeah. as appropriate for demonstration and streamlining. Which but that's was, that's my yeah. opinion. Yeah. And and that's that's what I think should be streamlined because you've already got, identified these areas as appropriate and with the minimal impacts to other activities and, and stuff. So well, that was, that's that my was at least the intent. Some of the if you look sure. at it, it was the intent. I'm not sure that was the outcome of the territorial sea plan because we could sure. disagree about the actual right. refs of location. But if you look at it, it's idea. Yes, that's yeah. true. But if you look at significant impacts and you and you say to any reasonable person that's representing only less than three percent of the whole territorial sea, it's hard to show a significant impact unless it's an oil rig leaking over the rest of the, <laughs> you know, so so that's my point. And yes, I was talking about streamlining for those areas, exactly. But that's that. my opinion, not the industry's, <laughs> and as a planner. So yeah. I have to point out, so we're, we're definitely drifting into the conversation that's coming up regarding the general authorization, general permit, right. and what are the sideboards, so. Let's, let's be careful we don't go too far down that path. But I want to make sure we're all at a comfortable place with Chris's memo regarding the definitions. And I think the big, Chris, you had posed some questions. I did. We didn't even get to that section yet. Yeah. Did you answer them already? No. no. Oh. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Kirk. Rick Williams. I'm on the line. Thank you, Eric. Welcome. 
Thank you. So I had two, two quick things. One, we, we did have a question on the first page. Should the DSL allow some type of first right to apply? Are we going to Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was up mm -hmm. there. <laughs> Do you have a question? Do you want to get to the rest of the memo, which we'll get I, to your question? I just wanted to bring up a general point. I'm trying to respect your agenda yeah. and when we talk about proprietary and when we talk about regulatory. But I think it's really confusing for those of us who don't do that all the time uh, to understand the time frames and the um, what we're expediting if, we're, if what we're looking at is a mechanism for expediting. If we expedite the removal fill process and the proprietary process for the same application or the same project still has to have a JART, have we really expedited anything? That's a great question. So, um, so I just want your help kind of coupling those two and figuring mm -hmm. out how they're going to work together because if we're all, if we're as a group only looking at one and then the other right. I don't think we're actually doing anybody any service in terms of expediting mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so I'll have That's a proposal sure. on that when we kick off that discussion of GA versus GP thank you yeah. so no it's great so quick let's just run through this real quick because it came up as one of our parking lot issues uh, scientific experiments where there's not an ocean energy conversion device being tested. Uh, for just putting out scientific measuring devices, the department typically authorizes those as under special use rules. Uh, if it's shorter than a year, we'll usually grant a short-term access authorization for those. I have some examples of uh, projects in the territorial sea that we have issued short-term access authorizations for, one collection of sediment samples, by University of California Santa Cruz, go banana slugs. Uh, another was a deployment of acoustic recorders off of Douglas County by Reedsport OPT. It was outside, and they put those outside of their demonstration project area to, to do some, uh, some measurements, so that came under short-term access authorization. We've also um, given short-term access authorizations to uh, ODFW for deploying acoustic receivers for the green sturgeon surveys off of Douglas County. So those are under a different set of rules. Um, we've also given some special use licenses and leases for um, long-term scientific projects. One is the establishment of uh, Nimric. Nimric as a, as a station is a special use lease. Devices that go in there will get, will get um, temporary use authorizations as demonstration projects and have to meet all the financial assurance requirements that are in statute. Uh, another was a more long-term deployment of acoustic seafloor hydrophone mooring platforms off of uh, Clatsop County by uh, Oregon State University. I think there's some utility to, to, to authorizing just scientific measuring devices for, for any applicant through this. I think it is, it just goes through part two. I think it's a much uh, streamlined process, especially if you're not actually going to test a device. You don't have to convene a jart and you can collect your info and go, go upon your way. Um, we we'll come we back. Have to trust your department that's going to get it right in terms of conflicts with others. Yes, but there's still there's still a process. There's just not a part five process for for us administering those those applications and, and permits, whichever side of the house that those come under. Uh, and then lastly, because it was teed up, uh, this this has come up once before. We had a real life example with Aquamarine Green Power when they came to Oregon in 2010. Uh, they wanted to uh, deploy quite a few acoustic Doppler current profilers off of three counties, and they wanted them authorized under the ocean energy rules because they wanted that first right to apply for a lease. Uh, when we did not, we did not agree to process those under 140 because there wasn't that ocean energy conversion device that was being deployed. We did offer to uh, authorize the deployment of those devices under 125, which would allow them to collect their data, but would not have had a first right to apply. Um, that's clarified and should be um, a rationale that was both in the memo and in the letter that was sent to Aquamarine by uh, Director Soliday. But this all leads to the question that I would like RAC input on, and that is, uh, should we allow some sort of first right to apply to a commercial entity if they want to deploy scientific um, data collection devices as opposed to ocean, uh, actual ocean energy conversion device? And if so, what would be those, those sort of sideboards? It's tough. Jason and Scott. Scott was up. Scott and Jason. Uh, and I don't want to answer your question. Okay. Because that, that, I put my tent up before that. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
I think Ono hit hit it quite well when he said we have to trust the agency in these situations. And, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to the agency, but I don't think that often the agencies understand the impacts of some of these uh, what would seem to be very minor uh, installations. And I think back to the uh, principal power project where they put some kind of a current meter or something in the water. This is in federal waters, of course. But they did it with, and it was just a, you know, yeah, go do it. And, and in fact, what happened was they used uh, uh, acoustic releases for those things and left uh, equipment on the seafloor, not equipment, but uh, railroad wheel uh, anchors, moorings right in the fishing ground. So uh, now principal power is gone, that project's not going to happen, but that ground is fouled for a uh, probably uh, a half mile um, uh, diameter area around that point where those anchors were abandoned uh, because they use steel wheels that are going to be a problem for for trawlers that, that fish that area. So I think we have to make sure that if this kind of an authorization is allowed for science equipment, there has to be a requirement that, uh, you know, that whatever goes in comes back out, that uh, there's no uh, no anchors, no acoustic releases used to leave stuff on the seabed, or that it's done in a way that doesn't uh, foul the grounds. Great. Thank you. Um, just two or three comments here. First of all, I think that the standards that would be applied for research related to marine energy ought to be the same standards that apply to any other form of research. So they're not allowed to leave stuff in the water for NOAA comes in and wants to study X. Their stuff comes out, then ours comes out. If theirs gets to stay in, ours gets to stay in. Um, uh, secondly, I, I question whether a Section 125 lease could ever apply to an aquamarine or any other private company because the definition of research project says that uh, it only applies to educational slash research institutions. So I don't know how they would ever have qualified for a 125. Maybe they shouldn't. No. Well, they did. And, but, um, but I also think that the question that they raised at the time was entirely appropriate they were going to invest you know, a lot of money, probably seven figures plus, to do those research projects over a period of time. And they wanted to ensure that if one of those areas turned out to have excellent resource and met their other basic requirements, that they would actually be able to be the first in, first in time to develop, to apply for the permits to develop that site. 125 doesn't provide that for you. I think that uh, if we're correct that the research project for 125 only applies to an academic institution or at a research institution like a National Renewable Energy Lab or a NOAA or whatever, then we may consider adopting some language that would apply to a Section 140 lease that that would replicate at some level what you would get from a research facility, research lease, okay. a, 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 a special use authorization special under use. 140. You okay. would find people with very different opinions about that. Oh, I'm sure. So you lost me on your first question. Of, um, I didn't catch. The, but I, I see what you're saying. You are looking for some sort of first right to apply for yeah. the employment. Right. So they're not going to. Uh, I mean, if it, if I'm correct that a Section 125 special use authorization would not apply for a private company that came along and wanted to deploy ADCPs, for example, example, if that's true, then we're taking that off the table for private companies. We're only talking about Section 140, either a temporary use authorization or a lease. So I don't, so yeah, that's where you look. You you're, you're not buying right? that. So you think that uh, a private company could qualify for a 125 special use authorization? Yeah, why not? For just, a, because for just research, deploying acoustic Doppler been. profilers? Or anything it's else? A, it's not a research project yeah. under the, the definition. Yeah, but not, not connected up to, right. to the slippery slope. Of, a research uh, project is for deploying a is under 140, right? Research project, you're talking about the def definitions earlier. Oh, one research is only for 140. Yeah, that definition is from 140, yep. Yeah. And so that would be testing a wave energy device that for that OSU or, or U of O or yeah, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo or somebody else wants to go test out there. That would be a research a demo, a re a research project, not a demonstration project. So an aquamarine could qualify for 125 special use authorization. That's what we t asked. That's what we told but them. But they don't get a first right, first in time right. Bingo. Yes. Yeah. 
Could we adopt language that would insert them under the research project 140 so they could secure first in time rights to, to research that's projects that's under 140 don't get a first right to apply? And that would be vigorously opposed. Why? Why? Because, again, the, given the nature of the territorial sea plan, how wide open currently, if, if, if Joanne and I had our way, we would, if, if, if in fact we had some advanced vetting. Of, so I don't care if they if they go into places that are thoroughly vetted and everything like that, and then there could be some potential build outs and everything like that. That those kind of connections, and I would understand a company would like. I understand that a company would like that, Jason. But a company the, demands that for for investment in the state. It's the same for our industry as any other industry. If they're going to go and analyze a piece of property and spend money on environmental tests to make sure that the property is clean, it's not a brownfield, et cetera. They're going to want to have to deal with the local organization or government that controls that property. That if it passes their muster, their test, and they're going to be able to be the first one in time to. Because what would they like to do? Have another com another company come in after after they've spent the money on ensuring that's an appropriate site, and then just get pushed completely out of the process. That would be unfair, and it wouldn't apply to their industry any more than it would apply. To What's unfair is 90 percent of the territorial sea at this point is open for that's a, that's the discussion of the territorial sea plan until. So uh, panel of oh, judges do, changes so that. Not We're not having that they conversation. Can be divorced from each other. I'm not having a conversation, conversation about some other setting. Plan but I think we, I think process. we got back around. So we, That's not on the we table got back here. to the question uh, that I posed. I think here was it, so. Do we have a good understanding? Research project under 140 could be for like Oregon State testing a device, a device, not not acoustic Doppler profilers. Demonstration project, which has the first right to apply, would be OPT or Finavera testing a device under uh, temporary use authorization. That's the only thing that has the first right to apply currently. So the other so the other part to this, which I brought to try to bring in with the memo, would be testing scientific, just collecting data, or deployment of scientific um, collection devices, whatever they may be. I don't know what they might be. And that's under Division 125. That's under 125. And there's no first right of use, yes. first right under 125. Yes. But but you can but you can't. Uh, I'm reading this memo and it's saying that they didn't get authorized to put in the tests. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't continue on after they, they chose not oh, to invest because they, because couldn't they couldn't get the get first, first right. right. I yes. see. I so see. the question That's is. That's the issue. Uh, uh. And I think you got to it. <laughs> does, does the RAC want to consider allowing some sort of first right? It sounds to like apply. that would be under 125. Though. Under like so if if an, if a commercial operation applies to deploy acoustic Doppler current profilers. So this is a question you, we can look at in this rule. That's why I'm asking you guys this. Under 125, because we could write something in there, it says that if they do, and they're holder in good standing or something along those lines, should they be allotted some sort of first right to apply for doing that sort of research? And what does that mean? And what does that mean? You know, Jason, I'm not sure that your characterization that somehow someone's not going to invest in characterizing a resource unless they're locked in to be the ones to get it is entirely accurate. I'm sure it's not 100% accurate, but it certainly and well, would be and, the and starting I'm, point I, for a conversation. Well, and it, for, for some of us, given the scale of the territorial sea planning that allows for development, which you don't want to talk about in this setting or others probably, makes something like that a non-start for some of us in terms of... Kirk and Chris, can I have a uh, input? Uh, just a sec. Let's have Anno finish his point here. No, I, 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 Rick always adds very knowledgeable stuff. I'd love to hear him respond because I because I do want to know what he what what he's uh, what he thinks about that. Go ahead, Rick. Go ahead, Rick. Thank you. Uh, the deployment of oceanographic instrumentation costs money, and it generates data. The data with processing generates information and knowledge. Which benefits the state? We, we want to encourage people to deploy instrumentation as long as that data is in the public domain and the results are published. So if a company or a research organization is going to deploy and if the information is not going to be close held, it's going to be in the public domain, then it would be reasonable to encourage that behavior by providing a first right to a deployment on that site. 
and that's how we get more information about the territorial sea than we would through the normal grant process and government funding of research. Very good point. Thank Rick, you. And just thank you for that, Rick, and it's Anna again, but would it be advantageous and promote research if based so much so much of our dealings with the with folks that want to do stuff offshore claim our claim non disclosure agreements and proprietary knowledge? Would it would it be an incentive to that for that community to not require public disclosure of some of that information that would be de deemed proprietary, uh, and then we wouldn't have to worry about you know someone benefiting some other company betting from the proprietary information effect of, of a company that did did go ahead and put it put the work and put the research out there. Hmm. Well, that's an equally valid approach. I'm not sure that it benefits the the overall public or the companies or the industry or the community at large to have data uh, collected and not reported. I, I think it's kind of the Oregon way to, if you're going to deploy instrumentation, then you publish the data. And that's why I think there ought to be some consideration if, if you're going to suffer the expense of deploying the instrumentation and there's an opportunity to, to develop there, you ought to get the first right. So, Delia, is that? So, did you say, Chris, that uh, there is already a first right to apply under 140? There is a first right to apply under 140. Yes. And where, where is that? That is, we're going to find it. I think it is okay. early on in 140, OAR 140, I believe it said policies. Okay. It might be uh, OAR 140. This is for the, the record, and then we can. You guys can look at it at your, at your uh, leisure. 140, 141, 140, 00. 30 policies. No, it's in purpose and applicability. 0010 sub 7. Except for education slash research institutions, and research project, the holder of a temporary use authorization to conduct a demonstration project okay. shall be given a first right to apply for an ocean renewable energy facility lease with authorized area specified in the temporary use authorization. If such first right to apply is not exercised within 30 days of the expiration date of temporary use authorization, the first right to apply shall expire. Terrific. Okay, so my point, I'll be quick, is that maybe 140 is the better place to look than 125 if we could redefine demonstration project to accommodate something. I think this came up at the last meeting too. So. If that's already in there, that might be a better approach than redefining more in 125. Unless yeah. that's unless ESL has a specific purpose in mind for looking at 125. We don't, but I was thinking we would just add maybe even add something to that in, in 140 that says uh, a special use license for the deployment of scientific instrumentation under 125 shall also be given some sort of first right to apply. And then we, no one said it yet, except for the legal students from here, well, we, there's actually no other uh, meat and potatoes to what a first right to apply uh, provides you in 140. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess that also, if you guys wanted us to look at that, it's probably worth flushing out what you, what is, um, okay. yeah, what do you get? So I'm, we're going to have to start wrapping up. I do want to hear yeah, yeah. yes or no. I just, on a real quick comment. I, uh, to me, I, I would have to stare at this a little bit longer to decide whether or not a 140 approach or 125 approach is better. And for me, it's six one and a half dozen the other. I think there's something to it. If, if, if you want to incentivize someone to make the investment in, in that kind of project, it's the, it's the wave energy equivalent of a MET tower for wind where they routinely put something out in a space for a year or more to try to understand with resources before they justify making any additional investments there. It makes sense that they would have the ability to, to, to move forward the first time. Uh, Rick's point, uh, real quick, on the um, uh, on the information. I mean, in general, I agree, uh, especially if you were using OET dollars for the investment in the, in the, um, the study, the information should be completely public. Um, and we, we, we made, made sure that was the case. I'm not sure that's appropriate for all kinds of projects. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if Met Tower, for example, information in the wind industry is proprietary or if that's something that goes into the national d database. I'm not, not a clue. Uh, but I could see how it might have value to a company and they would not want to uh, make that public. 
when it could, you know, it might be, and it's really worth, it, it, it's a pretty darn good analogy for this, the, the net tower thing, because it, before, you, before you're going to do the full deployment, you're characterizing the resource. So it, it is a really, probably a very fertile ground to, to look for precedent and how, how it rolls out in that industry. And, and uh, not being an expert on terrestrial wind, hard to know exactly how that plays. It might, might maybe it has different rules, but it's worth looking into. I mean, offhand, I know that towers on state-owned land, did we give them a first mm -hmm. right? Yes, I believe they do. So other up, upland renewable energy, geothermal, because we own a lot of uh, wind energy, uh, are covered under OAR 125 special use rules, and I believe that there is a first right to apply for those similar renewable energy projects for the deployment of things like MET towers. So, but that begs the question, though. I mean, so what if... If, if I'm a company and let's say it's a, it's a terrestrial lease for a wind project on state lands, mm -hmm. right? and so I'm I've got it, and uh, at that point there's been a vetting, I suppose, within within your agency that that, that area is appropriate for. That there's been commentary from ODFW on on the obvious avian impacts and all these other kinds of things. So all that's been fact. I, I would think that there is a one would hope. And in, in the past, I've been rather surprised at how little advanced planning there is in terms of these kinds of things that you would front load the planning side, like we tried to do, at least in theory, with the territorial sea plan. And so that, therefore, by the time you get ready to give, to give, an aid, to give a private sector company a lease for a, for a site on, on public lands, that the environmental impacts, impacts on such and such, ODFW impact, all those kinds of things are factored in. And yeah, at that point, that it kind of this relates to the thing we've had all along here. After proper vetting, expedited preference treatments look start to make sense and don't violate the other public interests. Uh, without a lot of upfront vetting, that's where some of us believe that that might not necessarily be in the public interest because you set into into motion a chain of events. That's very hard to stop later on. And we, when we've seen major conflicts of offshore oil and gas development in the United States, there's been litigation for decades now over this, we see development interests piecemealing this kind of development uh, with, the, with the first, oh, it's just this, or it's, oh, it's just research, or it's just that. And then, it, then in effect, it, it cascades into full development. And so, again, for some of us, since it's 2016 and not one, you know, 1916, this kind of upload, up, upfront vetting, citing, you know, it's it's kind of it's real. Just to close the, it's a long torturous comment. The, the more vetting up front, the less heartburn about expedited preferential treatment. You know, and it's just the opposite. If there's if there's none of that stuff up front in an open landscape. One would want to have the least amount of preferential treatment expedited. That there is, there are bright lines between each of these sections, and that they're that they're really not just lines on paper. They're, they're going to be substantive reviews uh, of you don't get to go to the next step because of what we've learned. So now again, I offered up the idea that some of the companies might want to retain some of that information privately uh, for that for that reason too. It's like because I think we're in the right place at the right scale, I think we're all in favor of inducing and, and trying to get, get this kind of activity going. It's just where we where we depart is where and, and at what scale, and what are the necessary uh, consequences of doing that. Scott, and then Ian. I would hope that first right of uh, first first rights to an area would simply mean that and nothing more that. You don't get any pass on anything. If you put a MET tower up or a, a current profiler or whatever the, the device is in an area, as I read in Delia's copy, it has you have to identify the footprint that you're asking for. So if you're going to ask for a footprint of, of uh, two miles by two miles, because somewhere in that box you're going to put a, a current profiler that will eventually allow you to potentially get this first drive for the Device, that should give you absolutely no pass to uh, other than 
first right. You have first right before anybody else. Doesn't give you any kind of a pass on any of the other requirements and the there vetting is. that needs to that needs to take place. I agree with that. Yeah. And I think that'd be some of the questions you want to ask is what well should you get a first right for how big of an area as as well. That's part of the sideboard questions we asked. If you choose to say as a group recommend that yeah you should if the group recommends that we should take a look at expanding who and when you get a first right to apply and flush out what we need to flush out what that means and what the sideboards would be for that. Card scrolling every Andy. Yes. And yes. we'll try to wrap it up. So Andy, is it Jillian then on it? Yeah, so I agree with Scott and what all of you have said, part five is still going to apply when they apply for a commercial lease. It's not like any of the standards that we wrote in part five are going to go away. Um, so I do believe that for companies' purposes in terms of investment, a first right of um, to apply would be appropriate. Um, I do have a little bit of heartburn in terms of how we define the area that an individual is talking about because a lot of these devices can measure very large distances and we don't want somebody to be able to put out 11 or 12 of these things and then have the, the whole territorial sea locked up. Right? Um, as Aquamarine aptly pointed out, someone might try and do. Um, so I think that we would want to clarify the how we would want that area to be uh, described, um, scope. Like what what yeah, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. You know, like just because you put out a profiler in one place doesn't mean you get five miles in a radius around it. Uh, so I think that we as a group should think about how we would like to have that information come to us if it is part of this. Thank you. F following that thread, um, you know, I'm no fan of the Outer Commonwealth Shelf Lands Act, but there is something that, and, and, and before I talk about what I kind of like about that act, uh, one of the things um, that we might, might want to borrow for, for this for this purpose, but the the uh, bottom line is that let's let's go right to that. Is that if I if I apply under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act to the, to the Department of Interior for a piece of real estate out there, um, they have a they have a um, a determination of no competitive interest process, right? So right right now, and I think this is a really fundamental flaw in what's going on with with your agency that needs to be modernized and updated is that I can form a company tomorrow, apply for something, start engaging the agencies, tie things up. We all know site banking, all these kinds of things. So that, that kind of stuff is not helpful. So even legitimate companies are companies that are really trying to gain something. But the way to, the way to when you have strong due diligence requirements and when you have the potential is, again, with an unsolicited request under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, there's an immediate, the Department of Interior has to stop and see if anybody else is interested in this real estate. And this idea that someone's going to unilaterally go out there and start doing the kinds of things Andy is saying, or something, let's, let's say, much more modest, begs the question, wait a minute, should, shouldn't we have a timeout and see who else is interested? The, one of the challenges I think that we face, and that all of us face in this effort is, we have an industry that really doesn't hardly exist. It's in an R&D phase. So, but we shouldn't we be thinking in terms of creating a, a framework where there's a, there's a mature industry, where there are a number of companies that might want to competitively compete for a particular piece of real estate. And so that's, that's kind of the dilemma that, that some of the, the parts of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act that actually kind of make, I don't like unsolicited requests. I, I, I think that's an anachronism that we allow that on the Outer Continental Shelf. I feel strongly about that. As someone who's been around that act for decades, and there are a lot of people that think that ought to be changed. I don't know if anybody has the horsepower to think about doing that, but I think that needs to be changed. But we have, a, we have an opportunity to take a fresh look here at Oregon, look at this and kind of say, yeah, is this, how do we handle that? That's a really important, I like, I like Andy's point about the, what, what, what in fact are we uh, allowing to go forward? And again, but it's a real challenge for all of us to try to, you know, try to what birth a framework 
that we can all agree on that's more or less geared to a mature industry where they're flying elbows of com competitive interest versus an industry that really doesn't exist that's just, you know, kind of crawling out of the mud, trying to get a little foothold somewhere and doing some testing and, and, and worrying about some commercial development that's very unlikely to happen anyway. But it's, it, it, I think it's a good question for all of us as a policy matter. What, what, what kind of system do we put in place? The Pre-Cambrian thing or, or something that's actually blowing and going and, and, and is something that some people in this room are, are anxious to try to facilitate as a, as a mature industry. Thank you. Gillian. So I see this as less of a fish and wildlife issue, but to keep it from becoming a fish and wildlife <laughs> issue, um, I, I think uh, it would be important to us I think we could get on board with um, with some sort of a first right. It's, I mean, it's it's been employed for other industries, um, for other kinds of projects. Um, it would need two um, specific kinds of sideboards. One, the area threshold. I strongly agree with what Andy was saying about that. We want to keep something. If you have a demonstration project that's just a postage stamp, we want to keep that from giving you the first right to apply for several square miles. Um, at least in policy, you know, even if it effectively had that result, at least in policy, I think it should be very clear that one translates to one, not one that translates to five, um, and some sort of expiration duration as well, so that um, so that there's sort of a use it or lose it in the policy. So, you know, while while it's important, I think, to honor the investment that developers have made, it's also important to honor the potential investment that could come from other sectors or other developers. So let's not lock the place down. Um, and that's already in 140. There's a, you have to use it within, you have to apply within 30 days of the expiration date of the temporary use authorization. And that's in the same definition that um, Chris supplied earlier. So something along those lines, I think, is where you know we would support the discussion going. So i um it sounds like you guys are directing us to that we should take a look at um, expanding the first right to apply to the deployment of some sort of scientific measuring devices with with sideways. Mm -hmm. That's what I've heard here so far. Mm -hmm. There's not consensus about that. Yeah. So it no. sounds like you guys are open to looking at yes. some language that Chris would craft, not that you bought. No. Yeah. Bought into. Yeah. Yeah. And that those would be under the 140 language and not the 125. That well, it, that's what I'm thinking. That. But I'm thinking we could say that we would still issue. I, I'm a little. I'm struggling administratively, and I'll, I'll keep this quick because I know we need, we need to move on. Uh, breaking out. Acoustic Doppler current profilers deployed by an ocean energy company and putting them under 140 and then something that's deployed by anyone else, UI or uh, and having that under 125. I think it, I don't think it's that difficult to write into the rule that if we have a section and maybe write a real section on first right to apply and what it means to say that a demonstration project has a first right to apply. And maybe you say that. You don't have a first right to apply, and I don't want to leave the rack. You guys can do what you want, but maybe you don't have a first right to apply for an actual ocean energy lease by putting acoustic Doppler current profilers out. But maybe you have a first right to apply for a demonstration project, which is gets you to a first right to apply for an ocean energy lease, something like that. But if you want me to look look at draft language, drafting. draft Chris, language, this, yeah, this draft something you, for us to look at. This is where you should be assertive, I believe. Staffer for the agency. I'm, going, I'm undergoing a code amendment process for the Lincoln County plan. It's been around forever. And dealing with consultants and 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 yeah, there are policy issues, but there's there's sort of a, the natural flow within a within a regulatory structure that things really ought to be. And 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 it's not really a, a policy matter as much as it's, it's you just got to respect the integrity of that flow, and and that really should be more about coherence. And order within the agency and keeping it in the right track, uh, then just sort of let's just throw it over here because. So I, I, I would encourage you to assert yourself when that from from an agency. Perspective. Sounds good. So with that in mind, then I'll try to take have the broader takeaway here and. and well, the broader takeaway is you are miles away from think from all of us agreeing that that's yep. an appropriate okay. approach. Yep. 
And we have a drink. Hey, Chris? From... Yes. Who is this? this? This is Walter. This is Walter. I just wanted to... This whole thing between research and the, the industry, <clears throat> if, if I could put it in a nutshell, I, I would just like this to be... Keep research separate from the industry, and you need to acknowledge that there's a difference between doing research and prospecting. And if they're prospecting, they're not doing research. And that's just my comment. Thank you, Walter. And I'm going to give Laurel a minute. Laurel, do you have anything to say? We haven't heard. <laughs> Swanky. Okay, I'll give you an opportunity if you had something you I had something a while ago, but it wasn't important enough to, okay. to stop the conversation. So. <laughs> Justin, whatever for you. Uh, no, nothing to add. I, I just concur. I think it makes sense to what explore you know? language on first rights. And we'll probably need to check in with the director as well, make sure. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to suggest we go ahead and take our break now. We're oh, yeah. <laughs> halfway through the meeting. Uh, but let's keep it to five minutes, please. So let's reconvene at 20 of 3. And uh, Jason's going to do his presentation pretty darn quick. Awesome. Would that we had this structure with the Oregon Water Research Department and all the wells being drilled all the time. <laughs> Talk about a review of natural resources that really needs that. Oh my God. Yeah, right. But, so let's, let, I agree. So why don't we make sure that obviously we get through the removal fill, GAGP thing, and talk about the jar because those two topics kind of go hand in hand. Okay, all right. We have a TSP rematch. Thank <laughs> you.